There's principles and there's economics, but you can't have both. That's this week on Motoring 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Midas, for mechanics known for their work and their word. Trust the Midas touch. Okay, I know I've said it before, but there was a day when buying a vehicle was fun and simple. Small, medium, large, station wagon, or pickup truck. But of course, today, Car companies are bending over backwards trying to reinvent themselves, hopefully to get a bigger piece of the pie. Good example, Porsche. Who would have thought they'd ever build an SUV? But they did. But you know, there's one company I've always admired for sticking to its philosophy. That company is Subaru. From day one, it's been all-wheel drive, and they've refused to build an SUV. Until now. And this week, we're in the beautiful wine country of the Napa Valley in California, where Subaru is launching a world premiere of its largest vehicle. They're calling it the B9 Tribeca. But along with a new vehicle, Subaru is introducing a new segment called Progressive SUV. I think that um, the point that they're making is that uh, their customers are looking for larger vehicles and, uh, and if they want to stay with the Subaru brand then they're out of luck. They'll have to go somewhere else. So now what they've, what they've done is they've come up with a vehicle that uh, incorporates all of the good features of Subarus, the features that people have uh, historically um, really responded to and put it into what's a category that's become much more popular in the marketplace. We call it the uh, Progressive SUV. Um, that is a vehicle that actually combines all the attributes of a conventional sport utility vehicle in terms of functionality, ground clearance, and rough road capabilities to give the driving performance of a performance sedan. And we see this vehicle fitting in between the conventional midsize SUV and the luxury SUV segments and really provides consumers, especially in Canada, with an alternative vehicle to consider. B9 uh, stands for, uh, the B stands for boxer engine. Of course, every Subaru is a boxer. The nine is a category, a size category of vehicles uh, by Subaru. So that's made by, named by the factory. Tribeca, of course, is triangle below Canal Street, which is an area, very affluent area, uh, upscale, but also very stylish and trendy uh, in New York City. So it, it fits, again, the, the image of the vehicle and the mobility and the urban lifestyle, but also wanting to get out and, and get into the uh, cottage area and up north. We have five uh, different trim levels available with the B9 Trebeca. There are two five-passenger versions, and there are uh, three seven-passenger versions. Every B9 Trebeca comes with the powerful 250 horsepower engine, symmetrical all-wheel drive system, with variable torque distribution system that delivers a rear wheel bias for giving you that performance handling in the vehicle, a very um, VDC program, which is stability control program, provides safety. Um, all the safety features are standard in every single B9 Trebeca. The expectations we set in the briefing this morning that uh, this was going to be a vehicle that was going to give us a, a, a sporty ride, sporty flavor to it, and. Uh, we actually found ourselves driving on some of those roads that, uh, along the coast today that um, you began to forget that it was an SUV. It was handling like a sports car and it was actually a lot of fun. Like we were, I shouldn't say throwing it around, but uh, we were certainly, you know, pushing it and uh, it was responding beautifully. I, I was really impressed with the way it handled. It's a very smooth, uh, smooth riding vehicle. I think uh, people who are looking for a really quiet, comfortable environment are going to be very pleased. The seats are comfortable. The fabrics and the materials the, that it's made from are high quality. Uh, it's a very nice place to be and, uh, and on the road, 
quiet, um, smooth, um, uh, adequately powerful. Uh, you know, those are the things that I thought really set it apart. Well, personally, I found the front end styling uh, very unique. Uh, but we had a lot of people as we drove along giving us the thumbs up when they were looking at it. So uh, obviously everybody's taste is different. It certainly is distinctive and only time will tell if that's the right way to go for Subaru. Well, they did have to remain distinctive. And I think that in this marketplace with so many of the shapes being box-like, this car is going to stand out. I'd like to look at it in terms of uh, we're going to offer some serious competition to the other brands in the marketplace today. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign, blocking out the scenery and breaking my mind. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Talk pickup trucks and everybody immediately thinks Ford, GM or Dodge. This week on Test Drive we take a look at a truck that takes it all the way to the edge. The all new Honda Ridgeline. When Honda announced it was going to cash in on the truck phenomenon, many thought it would be a light duty part time Pris. As it turns out, nothing could be further from the truth. For example, hoist the hood and there's a strong 3.5 litre V6 that pushes 255 horsepower and a very welcome 252 pound-feet of torque. These numbers give the Ridgeline strong performance and the attributes demanded of a medium-duty truck. It also means a run to 100 kilometers an hour in seven and a half seconds and an 80 to 120 time of just six, both of which are good for a truck. This turn of speed is helped enormously by the willing five-speed automatic. It not only shifts smoothly, it dips down a gear whenever a burst of speed is needed. A pickup truck is nothing if it's not strong, and that this Ridgeline is. It's two and a half times stiffer than any body on frame compact pickup truck out there, and it's also 20 times stiffer through the rear end. They can mark that up to those large sail panels. The bottom line, this thing has a 1,550 pound payload, as well as a 5,000 pound trailer towing capacity. The reason for the Ridgeline's strength is down to its chassis. It builds a fully box frame into a unibody which gives the best of both worlds. Add some extra bracing and those sail panels and you can torque the body without fear of twisting it like a pretzel. As well as giving the truck the brawn it needs, this also gives the suspension a solid base of operations. The front struts and the rear multi-link design is firm enough to deal with loads yet compliant enough to take the sting out of a rough road. It also gives the Ridgeline decent handling. True, it does not rank up there with a sports car, but for a workhorse, it handled the pylon test in a remarkably stable and predictable fashion. This Ridgeline has been as well thought through at the back end as the rest of the truck. Lowering the tailgate extends the bed enough that you can put an ATV in the back end. Pop it up, flip another lever, and well, you get a truck first, an in-bed trunk. Now this thing's large enough, it eliminates the need for those stupid lock boxes. This thing's also one tough mother, as you're about to see. Part of the reason the bed escaped the torrent of boulders unscathed is its steel-reinforced composite nature. It's strong and robust, yet lightweight. A similar steel box subjected to the same test was battered into submission. Another key attribute the Ridgeline boasts is an all-wheel drive system, which is vastly superior to the part-time systems offered by the competition. In essence, it drives the front wheels until they slip, at which point fires up to 50% of the drive rearward. And it does so on a proactive basis, which eliminates the guesswork. It also ensures the drive is where it can be put to the best use. When you get behind the wheel of the Ridgeline, you realize how well this thing is dressed. Certainly a lot of other manufacturers have got it fully duded out trucks, but none of them quite seem to match the new standard set by this Honda. Along with power everything, including the moonroof, you get heated leather seats, dual zone climate controls, a great radio, navigation system, in behind that a six disc CD player, and off to one side, well, there's a port for your iPod. You know, all the luxury is all well and good, but you've also got to consider the other side of a truck, storage space. Well, it's got tons of it. Under the rear seat, 
you can lift the seat up out of the way. There's a massive center console that slides open. You've got a glove box, map pockets, and cubby holes galore. It really is very versatile. On the safety front, the Ridgeline gets front and side seat mounted airbags, as well as drop down side air curtains, a strong set of anti-lock brakes that provide short straight stops, and a decent dynamic stability control system that includes a traction control system. Combine this with the all-wheel drive system, which has a lock feature for the really gnarly bits, and the Ridgeline is equally adept both on and off-road. You know, as with just about everything Honda turns its hand to, the Ridgeline has been done very well. It's a very capable pickup truck and then some, especially when you look at the versatility. Let's just say the cat squarely amongst the pigeons. Tip of the week concerns GM full-size sport utilities. If you've got a Yukon, a Yukon XL, a Denali, or a Chevy Tahoe, and you notice that your cruise control stops working, it could be as simple as two burned out brake light bulbs. Discovered this inadvertently while working on one the other day. Complaint was no cruise control. We, we noticed in the owner's manual that cruise control and brake lights were shared the same fuse. When we changed the two brake light bulbs that were burned out in this vehicle, all of a sudden we had brake lights, but we also had cruise control restored without touching anything on the cruise system. So if you've got one of those vehicles with that symptom, don't take it in for an expensive diagnosis until you first check your brake light bulbs because two burned out bulbs can put your cruise control down. That's your Midas tip of the week. I think you need to look at three things, price, performance, and utility. I can tell you there's no car in the world that can offer you what Corvette offers. There are many that can give you two out of the three, but none three out of three. I would challenge any high performance limited production manufacturer to build something the cost of a Corvette, delivering the performance of a Corvette, and allowing you to stick two golf bags and a week's worth of luggage in there and take your wife on a golf vacation. There's nobody on the planet that can do that except Corvette. It's an amazing package. The first thing you'll notice is the much wider stance. It's 90, 90 millimeters in the rear wider. You've got a 13 inch wide tread to transfer the 500 horsepower to the street. Uh, the front fenders are obviously wider. The car sits about, oh, I would say almost an inch lower. It's about three quarters of an inch longer in the front. Um, the overall character, I think you can see, it just looks more purposeful. Well, we, we, we call it uh, functional brutality. Please welcome Le Mans Driver Championship and one of the founding fathers of the Corvette racing program, Ron Fellows. Well, this is my 10th year with GM racing. This is cool. And to be part of the Corvette program since its inception, um, and then, and then to, to be part of a, a brand new model, and it coincides with a brand new model race car, uh, this is, I, I pinch myself. This is, uh, this is cool. And, and, and I've been saying that I, I've got to do a fair amount of track driving with the Z06 at Z06, where we're from, uh, that is an awesome piece. And, and seriously, the, the, the amount of, as they call it, technology transfer, what's going on between the race car and the production car, this, this is as good as it gets. When you look at what the new Z06 is offering, the seven liter high performance V8 engine, a direct derivative of what we use in the race car, zero to 60 in the three second range cornering capabilities in excess of, of 1G. Tremendously big brakes for improved stopping power. This is as close as they can come to buying a race car. The new Subaru Tribeca can seat seven passengers, but like a lot of these vehicles, believe me, you don't want to be passengers six and seven. And speaking of seating, Subaru likes to brag that they have 62 configurations inside this vehicle, but none of us had the time or the patience to prove them wrong. Now, I do have one pet peeve directed not only at Subaru, but other manufacturers as well, and that is the turn signal. Last I heard, red means stop and yellow means caution. 
And if you've ever followed a vehicle and they've got their brake lights on, could be day or nighttime, that red indicator is difficult to see. And you know, with everybody getting their shorts in and out over safety these days, why don't we have a standard that all turn signals are yellow? It seems like a simple solution to what can be a dangerous problem. All right, now let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Brad, I agree with you 100%. Turn signals should illuminate amber from both ends of the vehicle. I can think of three significant vehicles I've been involved in the last couple of years where the tail lights were amber turn signals, and then on a significant redesign of just the tail light assembly, not the whole vehicle, they changed that lamp assembly back to a red turn signal indicator. It makes no sense to me at all. Amber is so much more visible in fog, snow, and virtually any conditions, it should be universally accepted. Anyhow, this week I want to talk about wheel bearing, hub and bearing assemblies, and the fact that in, in many of today's vehicles, the, the hub and bearing assembly, which I'm going to show you in just a second here, is integrated with the anti-lock brake sensor. And the anti-lock brake sensor in many of these vehicles also controls traction control, and in some cases, uh, operates your uh, low tire pressure warning system as well. So that's a pretty important sensor. Now there's the hub and bearing assembly which was brand new a couple of hours ago in this vehicle. I just replaced it. And interestingly enough on this same vehicle three or four months ago I had to replace the left front hub and bearing assembly. This one right here for a noisy wheel bearing. It was howling like crazy at highway speed. When you turned the steering a little bit the noise would change but it had a pretty significant noise. Now, when you look at this hub and bearing assembly, on the back, part and parcel of that is the anti-lock brake sensor. There's the sensor portion of this wheel bearing assembly. It comes as one. You can't buy one without the other. And this one was replaced for a noise. Now, the new one that I put in worked fine for a few months. And then just a few weeks ago, the customer started complaining the anti-lock brake warning lamp was coming on and the traction control lamp came on and eventually stayed on steady. So we had to replace this bearing, which was only a couple of months old, for a completely different problem. The problem with this one, the bearing was quiet and fine, nice and tight, but the anti-lock brake sensor, the portion in the back here, was gone, and that's what brought the light on on the dash. Now when this assembly is mounted in the steering knuckle, it's drawn into the steering knuckle by three large bolts, here, here, and back here. Then the anti-lock brake sensor plugs into the harness on the vehicle that comes along the lower control arm. When we're finished, we have to take the torque wrench and torque this nut in the center, the large one that goes on the axle shaft to 180 foot-pounds, torque the wheel studs to 100 foot-pounds, and all the other fasteners that are involved in this job need to be tightened with the torque wrench. That's an important step when you're doing a job like this. Now, in terms of maintenance, there's no way to maintain these bearings. You don't repack them with grease. You don't adjust them or service them. Once they're in there, as long as the bearing is good, it stays in there indefinitely. How long it lasts de is determined by a lot of factors. The only factor that you can control as a driver is don't whack it into curbs. Don't nail things. Uh, don't, you, don't nail curbs or any immovable objects that could bend your rim or damage that bearing because that can precipitate the bearing portion failing. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2005. This is a fairly typical urban intersection. Now look at the signs on that one post alone. One way begins, no access to Lakeshore, you got a, a walk, don't walk, light there, and no trucks during the night, and the, of course the regular traffic light, don't park. I mean, how the heck are drivers supposed to figure out all that stuff at one time? That's mighty confusing. But that's fairly typical of how we design our intersections. Of course, we've got the sidewalks for the for the people and the bicycles, and we got the roads over there, and you got the lines on the street. Everybody's regimented. Be here, don't be there. But there's a guy in Europe who's got a different approach. He says, the problem with that situation is that the people think they're supposed to be here, the cars think they're supposed to be there, and there's never any interaction between them. What he's come up with is a system whereby he takes away everything. No sidewalks, no line markings on the road, no signs, no traffic lights, no crosswalks, no nothing. Just let the people, the bicyclists, and the motorists figure it out on their own. And you know, it sounds counterintuitive, but he's done this in several places in Europe, and guess what? Not only do they have fewer crashes, fewer deaths, and fewer injuries, 
the traffic actually moves faster. Sounds weird, but it appears to work. Now, actually, you might have experienced something similar yourself. Ever driven during a power blackout when the traffic lights aren't working? What happens? Well, you approach the intersection more slowly because you don't know what's going to be going on. You make eye contact with the other driver, and maybe you wave him through. Everybody goes through the intersection. Nobody hurts. Nobody dies. It works out great. Not only that, you might even feel good about yourself because you've actually accomplished something by interacting with your fellow motorists. So maybe this guy is onto something. Whether it worked over here or not, we'll have to find out. But there is a little bit of theoretical background to what he's trying to do. Back in the 60s, an industrial psychologist named Douglas McGregor postulated two theories as to how employers should look at their employees. Theory X said, you assume people are stupid and lazy and have to be regimented in every single thing they do. Theory Y postulates that people are intelligent and well-motivated. All you have to do is give them the tools to do the job and they'll do the job. Maybe that'll work in traffic too. In other words, if you assume people are idiots, they'll never disappoint you. But if you assume they have half a brain, they might just surprise you. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, before driving the 2006 Subaru Tribeca, some automotive journalist, not known to have a cynical bone in the body, described the vehicle as an Outback on steroids. Well, it's true the Tribeca, like the Outback, is designed to go off-road, but that's where the similarities end. I mean, if you've always liked Subaru vehicles but always found the wagons just a little too cozy, the Tribeca is for you. Inside, plenty of comfortable room, lots of power, in fact, just a treat to drive. But you know, 10 years ago, Subaru sold 4,000 vehicles in Canada. Last year, that figure was 16,000. And what the company has discovered is that with every new model, sales have increased. Well, I'm willing to predict that with the new Tribeca, that trend will continue and Subaru showrooms are about to see some new faces. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Although the badging on the vehicle is subtle, there will be a buzz that the, that the vehicle is different. It is a hybrid, and hybrid is gaining some cachet. It's early yet to tell what it is. It certainly doesn't have the cachet of Emmy yet, but maybe it will someday. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Midas for mechanics known for their work and their word. Trust the Midas touch.